Welcome to TIA's Best Practices for Building Local Quality Assessments, part of the Implementing Student Growth Measures series. The agenda for this presentation is as follows. Section 1, Introduction and Objectives. Section 2, Validity and Reliability. Section 3, TIA Requirements and Considerations. Section 4, Questions to Guide the Development of an Assessment System. Section 5, Determining Assessment Quality. Section 6, Steps for Designing, Low, valid and reliable local assessments. And then section seven, review and next steps. Let's begin. The objectives of this presentation are, number one, to understand the components of what makes a quality assessment. Number two, to understand best practices in creating valid and reliable assessments at the district level. And number three, to align district created assessments to the requirements of the teacher incentive allotment. To begin our discussion, we will start with validity and reliability, the foundation of a quality assessment system. In this section, we will review these terms and their implications when designing and administering an assessment. During the course of this presentation, much of the discussion is centered on validity and reliability. Validity is the extent to which something measures what it claims to measure, and reliability means the consistency of the results. Let's take a closer look at these two terms and how they relate to the creation of a pretest post test system. When discussing validity, we need to ask if the tool we are using accurately measures student growth. What does this look like in practical terms? Let's say a district creates an assessment for their seventh grade PE class. The assessment consists of mostly multiple choice questions about health and anatomy, but does not measure performance for certain physical activities that happen in the class. With the majority of the seventh grade PE classes semester spent engaging in physical activity, the assessment of health and anatomy would not be a valid assessment. Let's say that the district also created a physical activity component to the assessment that required the student to do 40 jumping jacks, 30 push-ups, and jog one mile. That would increase the validity of the assessment since they are covering more of what is covered in the class. Another example of a valid assessment would be the SAT. Psychometricians have concluded that SAT scores are highly correlated to success in college classes. An invalid assessment example would be using a 12th grade reading assessment and a 12th grade English 4 class. While there may be some crossover to the content covered, it would be invalid since the reading assessment does not cover composition and rhetoric. When designing a test, validity is key to building trust in your assessment system ensuring accurate data is collected, and creating an environment where students are poised to succeed. Reliability is the extent to which results are consistent. The goal of creating a test is to reliably assess student learning, and in the case of TIA, student growth and teacher effectiveness. There are many factors that contribute to the reliability of an assessment, such as the fidelity of questions that prompt student responses, the subjectivity of questions asked, bias, etc. Looking at the example of a reliable assessment, we can see that Juan's Telpass scale score is showing he has normal or expected growth from year to year. There's not a dip in his performance and he's meeting expectations. Based on this, we would assume that the test is reliable. Looking at the non-example, we see that Judy ends up taking the exact test twice and scoring vastly different scores. Perhaps this was a fluke, but it's likely that the test would be considered unreliable since she should score pretty close to what she did before. We will discuss how to increase reliability in your assessment system as we proceed throughout the presentation. Now, let's take a look at a visual representation of validity and reliability. A test can be valid but not reliable and vice versa. Think of our assessment data as a dartboard. Now, let's imagine a 12th grade English 4 class. Looking at the reliable but not valid dartboard, an example would be an English 4 class taking an assessment that's really geared toward reading instead of composition and rhetoric. Though the scores are similar of what one would expect, they would not be considered valid since they are not an accurate representation of what was taught in the class. A test can also be valid but not reliable. So for instance, the English 4 class takes an assessment but the scores are all over the place. There may be many reasons for that a scenario like this could happen, but it's likely there was an issue with the directions, the wording of a problem, or perhaps even the scoring of the assessment. An investigation would need to be completed to determine the root cause of the assessment being valid, but not reliable. Our goal is to have both valid and reliable assessments for students to take. Using the third image on the dartboard, we can see that a valid and reliable assessment meets the mark of quality. 
All components of a successful system depend on validity and reliability. Now that we have reviewed validity and reliability, let's review the TIA requirements and considerations for district-created assessments. District-created pretest and post-tests are popular choice for districts. The pretest post-test is not a required growth measure by TIA. Districts also have a choice of portfolios, SLOs, or value-added measures. Pretest post-test for TIA can be used for any eligible teaching assignment. This includes both core and elective classes. The assessment must also be reliable and valid. Lastly, the assessment needs to be able to determine student growth. These growth targets can be set locally or by a third party. If the assessment is based on achievement and the district did not have a plan to calculate growth locally, then the assessment would not meet the criteria of TIA. Pause the video and examine this chart independently. Once reviewed, press play to continue. This presentation will cover pretest post-test creation. During this presentation, you will hear me refer to option three or option four. In the pretest post-test tab of the application, districts will choose which option they want to select. Let's take a moment and look at these options. Regardless of the option that the district chooses, the student growth measure must have validity of the content, have valid and reliable administration protocols, valid and reliable scoring protocols in place, and be, can be used to set expected growth targets. Option three is what we want to focus in on here as it consists of the district created pretest and post test with district created growth targets. In addition to the overall TIA requirements, district-created assessments also require strong content expertise to design the assessment and multiple levels of review to ensure that the assessment is valid and reliable. Let's examine each of these factors in detail. Districts will answer questions about the validity of content, administration and training protocols, the assessment review process, security protocols and scoring protocols. In this example, we can see how each statutory question aligns to the TIA requirements for district-created pretest post-test. Districts interested in locally created assessments will be required to meet full readiness on each question to have their TIA application approved. Now let's take a look at the application scoring rubric for option three. A rubric will be used to determine if districts met the statutory guidelines on their TIA applications. Pause the video and examine the requirements. Consider the requirements you already have in place and which systems will need to be built to reach full readiness on the TIA application. Once complete, resume the video. Districts should note that valid and reliable training is required for the administration of each assessment. Security procedures are in place for district created assessments and rigorous protocols are in place for writing the assessment, including qualifications to design district created tests. Other factors for districts to consider when selecting option three of the pretest post test are their review and approval process and how the district will set expected growth targets. Are the districts going to use the gap closure method, the quartile quintile method, Whichever method is chosen, the district would list that in the application. Another consideration is how the district will determine end of year growth and how will a teacher's growth data be calculated. Districts are encouraged to become familiar with the application scoring rubric and use it as a resource to determine application readiness. Let's now cover some key questions districts should consider to guide the development of district created assessment systems. We will explore the following questions in this section to determine the next steps for districts to take in developing their locally created assessment systems for TIA. How does your district determine which roles participate in the development of standards aligned district created tests? Who is responsible for managing the district created assessment development and review process? What is the district's process for reviewing and approving district created tests before the tests are implemented? And what security and administration procedures will be used to maintain the integrity of the assessment materials. We will begin by reviewing the roles and responsibilities of those who will be involved in creating assessments at the local level. Choosing the right personnel to create the assessment is likely the most important factor in implementing the district created pretest post-test model. While districts do have a choice to use a third party test, there are many instances where this may not be feasible. 
It is important the test creator understands the course standards and the basics of item development and vetting items. Teachers, instructional coaches, and district content coordinators can be wonderful test writers to be utilized by the districts. For smaller districts without a content coordinator or instructional coaches, teachers can be utilized to create and, vest and vet these assessments. One consideration is that the qualifications for creating a local assessments may vary by content area. We also need to answer the questions and sub questions for who owns the process. Number one, who sets expected growth, the district or a third party? Number two, who creates the test, teachers, content coordinators? Number three, who approves the assessment? Is the assessment going to go through multiple levels of review? Number four, how does the district determine individualized student growth? Which method is the district using to determine growth? Half the gap, percentage gains, etc. Number five, who is scoring the assessment? Will it be scored electronically through vendor products like DMAC or will an appraiser or teacher grade the assessments by hand? Number six, will the rubric be utilized to score the assessment? This is an important step for a writing assessment or for a performance-based class. Districts should choose at least one person to help build and maintain their assessment system to ensure alignment with all stakeholders. Districts also need a process for reviewing and approving assessments. A plan needs to be in place to vet all assessments that the district creates. A clear plan for the review process also needs to be in place to ensure the reliability and validity of the exam. Lastly, the district would need to approve the test. Who is going to give final approval for that test? These answers will be different for each district, but they are important in understanding the components of your pretest post-test system. In this graphic, we see an example of multiple levels of review that districts could utilize in implementing district-created pretest post-tests. At the bottom, we see the test writer, who is the first level of review. The test writer takes the assessment to the committee who will approve it. This committee could consist of teachers. Once the assessment passes through the committee, it will then be approved by an appraiser. And lastly, it would be time to pilot the assessment, gather data, and make changes before issuing the exam. I do want to note, small districts may not have the personnel for all of these levels of review. Small districts could consider working with nearby districts or ESCs to broaden their levels of review and increase the validity and reliability of their created assessments. In some cases, it may be the same person who is doing multiple levels of review with these small districts. This is acceptable if the process consists of a review followed by feedback, edits, and then another level of review. Piloting an assessment is a best practice, but is not a requirement. Additional questions we need to answer revolve around security and administration. What are the protocols and training the district has in place to ensure valid administration of assessments? Is there a training at the beginning of the year? Will the district incorporate star security procedures for their district created assessments? Another one we need to answer is how are materials going to be stored? Is it going to be in a locked room in a Google Drive? And then the last question we need to consider is what rules has the district created for test administration? Will teachers proctor their own students or will there be a proctor from another classroom? One resource that districts can utilize to create assessments is a free resource called TFAR or the Texas Formative Assessment Resource. It allows districts to create assessments administered through Cambium. See the links at the bottom of this slide for more details on TFAR. What makes a quality assessment? Is it the font used, the rigor of the questions, stretch of the test? It's all of the above and then some. Let's examine some of the elements that make up a quality assessment. Let's review the elements that make up a quality assessment. We will talk about each of the following characteristics in this section of the presentation. Number one, determining learning outcomes and ensuring alignment to standards. Number two, various item types. Number three, item arrangement. Number four, levels of rigor. Number five, length or time of the assessment. Number six, clear directions. And number seven, styling. Let's start with standards alignment. We want to use the TEKS as a guide when determining learning outcomes. For instance, an Algebra 2 class may want students to learn how to do quadratic functions, 
While this is certainly needed, and there are multiple techniques in Algebra 2 that requires the student to use quadratic functions, um, including inequalities, incorporating them into equations, etc. The point is, we would need to do a deep dive into the techniques to see exactly how we want to test student competency with quadratic equations. When we are determining learning outcomes, be sure they are specific and realistic. For instance, the floral design uh, TEEK 3B states, students classifies and identifies plants used in floral design. This seems very specific and realistic to learn in a floral design class. An assessment could be created to test this learning outcome of identifying plants used in floral design. How much time should we allocate to testing? The answer is complex and can vary from course to course. Statistically, higher grade levels have more questions on their assessments. Longer tests can increase reliability, but they can also take away from instructional time. The most important factor for any district to consider is time. Will students be able to complete the test in one class period? Will the school need to implement a practice star shutdown day? Districts would need to decide locally what works best for them. The amount of time a typical student needs to answer some of the following question types. 30 seconds for true false, 60 seconds for multiple choice, 120 seconds for short answer questions, 10 to 15 minutes per essay question with five to 10 minutes for students to review their work. Taking these numbers, an example could be in a 55 minute class period, you could have 17 questions of multiple choice with one 15 minute essay and allow 10 minutes for students to review their work. Districts would need to decide locally how much time it takes their students to answer questions on a given exam. The more complex the question, the more time it may take to answer. This is an example of the time a middle school social studies test might take. Times and question types would need to be adjusted accordingly for older or more advanced students as well as younger students. Districts should consider implementing some of the star redesign item types in their local assessments to increase familiarity with these new item types. Differentiating item types can elicit a higher level of thinking and can show how students applied their knowledge as well as it supports differentiated instruction and learning models. There's not a one size fits all approach to the world of assessments and testing students with varying item types increases the reliability of the data. The benefits of non multiple choice questions. Number one, they can elicit a higher level of thinking for students. So for instance, having a two part question where a student has to defend their answer in part B. Number two, they could align with questions asked in the classroom. For instance, students are graphing in the classroom Using a graph on STAR aligns well with what students are doing already. Number three, it can show how students applied their knowledge. Sometimes students select a response on a multiple choice test without thinking it through. Oftentimes these answers do not provide the teacher with a why or how the student answered the question wrong. Being able to see students work and their thought process through these redesigns allows educators the chance to refine their systems and provide needed interventions. And then number four, it's more engaging and interactive for students. Students can become bored and complacent when doing a multiple choice only test. These new item types engage the student in a more interactive format, which in turn can combat test fatigue. Item arrangement should be taken into account. The way we arrange our items can make us, our assessment more reliable and valid. One best practice is to group items of a similar format together. For instance, grouping multiple choice questions with other multiple choice questions and short answers with other short answer questions. Another practice that should be considered is to arrange the difficulty of questions from least to most difficult or arranged in ascending difficulty. This helps students to complete some of the less strenuous questions quicker and allows more time for the more difficult questions. For instance, on a history exam, the first part of the assessment may consist of recall type questions, while the latter half may require students to make inferences based on statistical data or to argue a point in an essay. For digital assessments, ensure that students have a place on their computer to work out problems and write notes. If this option is unavailable, students can use 
scratch paper in lieu of a digital space. Another point to make on item arrangement is to leave enough space for students to work out problems and implement their note taking and highlighting strategies. If students don't have the room to implement practices learned in the classroom, this could affect the reliability of the assessment. To arrange and evaluate created items, a taxonomy should be used. Bloom's and Webb's depth of knowledge are two examples of this. When creating an assessment, one should aim for a mix of both higher and lower difficulty questions. According to researchers, the SAT reserves about 10% of questions asked to utilize higher order thinking skills, such as analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Another best practice is to have a mix of both higher and lower level questions to gauge student mastery across the achievement spectrum, also known as stretch of the test. Does styling matter? In short, yes. The styling of an assessment should not be intimidating to students. The styling should allow room for students to work on problems and implement strategies they learned in the classroom. If possible, designing an assessment to resemble STAR would be considered a best practice in Texas. Districts creating their own assessments should consider using STAR styling, with the, which is a size 10 to 11.5 veranda font, with at least 1.5 to 2.5 inches of space between questions and provide clear visual aids when applicable. In some, the more familiar a student is with the assessment styling, the more reliable it becomes. Let's review the elements that make up a quality assessment. Determining learning outcomes and ensuring alignment to standards. Various item types, item arrangement, levels of rigor, length and time of the assessment, clear directions, and styling. Now that we have reviewed what makes a quality assessment, let's get into the steps in designing a valid and reliable local assessment. Progressing through these steps to create local assessments that are more valid and reliable will give you confidence the scores are truly a measure of how well each student understands the tested content and that the teacher did indeed teach this content and therefore contributed to the child's assessed growth. Step one, identify the learning outcome or objective of the test and how it is aligned to core standards. Step two, determine the formats of items to be used. The best practice is to use various item formats and align with the new item types for STAR redesign when possible. Step three, construct a pool of initial items. Step four, review items and revise when necessary. Step five, combine vetted items into the group of items that will be on the test itself. Number six, consider the levels of difficulty or the stretch of the test. And number seven, implement best practices around item arrangement, test length, style, directions, etc. Step eight, pilot the assessment and revise when necessary, whenever possible. Note that this is a best practice and we understand that it's not always feasible for every assessment. And then step nine, administer and score the assessment. Let's begin by reviewing step one. Identifying the test purpose and objectives is paramount in designing a quality assessment. The objectives set the foundation for the other pillars to rest on. Before item creation, test creators need to identify the objectives they want to assess. In the state of Texas, TEKS allows the creators to quickly identify the objectives. From the selected objectives, all items will be developed around them. Using seventh grade Texas history as an example, one of the TEKS has students organize, interpret information from outlines, reports, databases, and visuals, including graphs, charts, timelines, and maps. The assessment creator would need to include questions and have students interpret information from maps, graphs, or charts for the assessment to be valid. Let's take a look at this example. Miss Lawrence is an Algebra 2 teacher working with the math department on designing a pretest. Miss Lawrence knows that all items on the test will stem from their agreed upon standards aligned objectives. Her department decides on the following objectives graphing linear, quadratic, and exponential functions, 
solve linear and quadratic equations with a variety of methods algebraically and with the ca graphing calculator, and solve and apply systems of equations to inequalities. Now that the objectives for the assessment are specified, Ms. Lawrence can move on to the next part of building a quality assessment, which is determining the item format. Now that Ms. Lawrence has her objectives, she needs to decide how she is going to assess them. She decides that for the purposes of her assessment, students will be best suited to graph linear equations on graph paper. She decides that she will use multiple choice to assess if students can solve and apply systems of equations to inequalities, and she also wants them to show their work and has a word problem at the end for students to show the steps they took to complete their work. Now that Ms. Lawrence has determined item format, she can move on to constructing an initial pool of items. Now that Ms. Lawrence has determined her item format, she is going to construct her initial pool of items. She wants her assessment to be in line with the new questions on star redesign and notices that 25% of the items on the new star will consist of redesigned item types. She begins to write her initial pool of items based on the objectives and uses the table of specifications to ascertain their level of difficulty. The table of specifications can be very basic, simply listing the skills to assess in one column, the number of questions to test this skill in the second column, the level of difficulty you intend to use for each question in the third and fourth columns, and then the number of total points for each skill in the fifth column. By determining the number of questions to cover each skill and the point value assigned to each skill, you are deciding on the relative importance of each skill. This can also assist with validity by making sure you are adequately covering the tested content. Then, by determining the level of difficulty of each skill, you will be deciding on the type of question format appropriate to test each skill. The stretch of the test is its ability to measure growth across a wide variety of ability levels. For instance, Ms. Lawrence gives her Algebra 2 test to students, but the questions are too easy for most of the students and the grades come back overinflated. And she was unable to see if students were in the lower, mid, or upper tier of mastering the content. The next year, she includes a few harder questions to be able to see precisely where the gaps are for her higher achieving students. Does the test give reliable data for both the highest and lowest achievers? The best practice is to have a mix of both higher and lower level questions to gauge student mastery across the achievement spectrum. Consider making a table of specifications to determine the types of items you should write or use from an item bank, which we will talk about shortly. After meeting as a group, the math department from Elm Tree Elementary decided on the following items to represent one high level and one low level difficulty question. Note, that the higher level question requires students to add improper fractions, whereas the lower level question just has students add fractions. Let's take a look at another example. Pause the video, read the slide. Once complete, push play to resume the presentation. Note that the higher level question requires the student to make an evaluation. This skill is higher on Bloom's taxonomy than analyzing which the lower level question asks us to do. Next, it's time to review items. It's best practice to do this through a committee, and then once it has passed the committee, it could be approved by an administrator. Be sure to complete this step, even if you're using an item bank to ensure the validity and reliability of the questions. During the review and revision process, it's a good idea to come up with a rating system for items and determine what the margin of error is for calibration on each item. The review process allows others to check for validity and come to an agreement that the questions are aligned to the content taught. Measurement error is reduced by coming to an agreement on the correct answer. Consider creating a table for rating the quality of each question. Best practice would be for each rater to be within one domain of each other before giving the test. Another best practice is to exclude any item types you are not in agreement on. Now, let's take a look at an example of a rating table. Looking at this rating table, we can see that the three items were rated excellent. One was rated average, while another one was rated weak. 
There is a section for comments in the far right column. In this case, the teacher felt that the students were going to confuse a word on the first question and the second question should be rephrased for clarity. The rater would compare their rating to that of their colleagues and determine which questions need to be changed or excluded. It is always a best practice to review and revise items in which raters were uncalibrated. Let's take a look at a question that needs to be revised from a seventh grade Texas history assessment. Notice that the unrevised item tests knowledge of state agriculture, physical features, flags, and economic activity. The revised item narrows it down to economic activity. This informs the teacher where the student is weak in their knowledge of Texas economics, thereby making the assessment data more reliable. With the unrevised item, the teacher would be unaware of which of the four areas the student is weak and may not be as successful with their future targeted interventions. Now that items have been reviewed and revised, we can now combine the items to form the test. Be sure to include best practices discussed earlier, such as star styling, leaving room for students to implement strategies, and clear visuals. Now it's time to pilot the assessment if possible. This is a best practice that may not be practical in all districts for all assessments. After reviewing items with colleagues, if possible, give the assessment to a group of students who are similar to the students who will be taking the assessment. Some options are piloting the questions and assessments you give throughout the school year, over the summer, or with the group of students who matriculated from the currently tested course, like students in a seventh grade theater arts class piloting an assessment for a sixth grade theater arts class. It is important that we look for clarity that the questions are giving the responses needed. Are students consistently answering a question wrong even though they have learned the material? If so, this would affect the reliability of the assessment. Perhaps the question needs to be rephrased and or omitted. The last step is to revise as necessary. No test is completely perfect, but they can become both fair and reliable through revision. During the piloting session, you may notice that some questions are not eliciting the correct response from students. There could be a few reasons for this. Words with double meanings, like the example of the word bark, does it mean bark on a tree or the bark of a dog? Using words with double meanings could make the test unreliable. Additionally, item or stem could be unclear, including the visual aids. Was the text too small? Was the visual aid used unclear? Clarity is key to having a valid and reliable assessment system. Another issue is the item may not be aligned to a taught skill where students expected to multiply and divide fractions while only being taught how to add and subtract fractions. If this is the case, then the assessment would not align to the skills taught and the assessment would need to be revised because the data would be invalid. And lastly, an item may have bias or cover a sensitive issue, which could also affect the reliability of the assessment. Let's take a look at a question that needed to be revised after piloting the assessment. The item needed to be revised because the teacher found out that the students did not have context for golf fairways. Almost every student who piloted this question missed it. Revisions need to be made. In sum, the item was not accessible and fair for students of diverse backgrounds. One group has an unfair advantage over another group of students. When we look at the revised item, students are familiar with the track from their PE class and this data would be more reliable. These are the kinds of things that are often found during the piloting process. The last step is to administer and score the assessment. Consider implementing STAR security protocols like proctored exams, limited access to the assessment before it's given, and locked in storage if applicable. Implementing such protocols will increase the validity and reliability of the assessment. Next, the assessment will need to be scored. Many districts have capacity to have these assessments scored by machine, but they can be scored by hand as well. Don't forget to incorporate a rubric for your essay and short answer questions. 
Continue to revise your assessment to increase reliability. After giving the assessment, you will notice some trends to be addressed. Be proactive in making the necessary adjustments before giving the assessment again. Now that you have a reliable assessment, you can reuse or modify the items by recycling them in successive years. Let's review what we learned and determine next steps districts should consider as they build systems for locally created assessments. To get started with developing local assessments for TIA, answer these questions. Number one, how does your district determine which roles participate in the development of standards aligned district created tests? Start the process of identifying stakeholders who, should, who could potentially be involved in the assessment design process. Next, determine who is responsible for managing the district created assessment development and review process. Once that has taken place, districts would need to decide on the process for reviewing and approving district created tests before they are implemented. And lastly, districts need to determine what security and administration procedures will be used to maintain the integrity of the assessment materials. The next steps for districts are to review the TIA readiness guide to determine the next steps in creating a local designation system. Districts, be sure to share this presentation and resources with the appropriate staff. Additionally, districts should review the TIA application scoring rubric to determine their system's level of readiness and preparation for the completed application this spring. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please email the TIA inbox at tia.tea.texas.gov. Thank you and have a great day.